Hi there. Uh, then my name is Lynn Hunter, and I'm back with the second part of drawing and painting a protoceratops. Um, we started out with thumbnail drawing, pencil, and this is the, the finished, or the, technically the, the next to finished ink, with um, basically, again, good old big stick. <laughs> Um, I also, another thing that, pen that I like to use and I'll be finishing up with, with more detail, is this is a Zebra, um, it's F301, and usually the, the, the F just stands for, it's, it's, um, one of their metal base, metal bodied pens, any, um, Zebra ballpoint pen will do for the fine point, the F stands for fine, um, again, along with, um, the big stick, the Zebra's probably my second favorite pen to use when it comes to this technique. Now what I'm doing here, the reason why I use ballpoint pen rather than um, um, some other pen, and I do use, um, I like Sakura Microns for um, an, an underdrawing, and I also like standard um, India ink depending on what type of, of uh, piece I'm doing. Um, but the, in this particular situation, I'm using the ballpoint pen because the ink is basically an oil-based ink. So the thing is, is because it's a, a petroleum distillate or, um, again, oil-based, oil and water don't mix. So the thing is, is that it's kind of like crayon resist, if you ever, the, which is wax resist. So that's actually not the same thing. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's, a, again, a water-resistant type situation. But because um, the petroleum pushes away the water, um, it doesn't soak up the, um, the water in this situation. Okay, what I'm starting, let me um, go back to what we're doing here with the painting. I'm using primarily, um, this is um, a yellow oxide. And... That's my, my undercoloring on the baby. Um, Protoceratops supposedly may have lived in a, a desert or um, um, a chaparral type environment. Again, um, if you missed the last video, the proto Protoceratops were found in Mongolia. Um, they, some of them were found in nests they found with um, mothers and in eggs. Um, there are um, actually quite a few skeletons of them complete and baby skeletons also so that's kind of one of the neat things about this particular dinosaur they've been able to come up with you know a, a type of life um, basis for them so that we, we know that they were plant eaters that they were also probably like herd like animals that they they um, may have lived in small colonies, um, and again, in a semi-arid environment, so that's why I'm starting him out with giving him a little bit of a yellow color. So it's like if he were found in the sand. I'm thinking, um, if you've ever seen horned toads, they, they live in, the, in a sandy environment. So I'm using um, more of a, like I said, a yellow oxide for his basis. Then I'm going to take a little bit of... Um, raw umber, which is, um, it's a kind of a, it's, it's not, it's, it's, again, it's a brown that's more to the yellow side. When I'm painting, um, I, my palette's pretty simple. Um, I always pick, like, I've got red browns and yellow browns and blue browns. So your, a red brown would be like burnt sienna is a very red brown. Um, this is raw umber, which is a, a yellow brown. Um, burnt umber goes warmer, whereas this is a, a yellow brown that is a little bit to the cool side. Um, burnt umber will be a yellow brown to the warm side. And I'll do the same thing with um, when it comes to my palette with blues and reds and greens. You just take your standard, um, your six basic colors that you have in a color wheel and take, so I'll have one of each 
of the six colors and then I'll take it one step to the to the warm or the cool. And then with my browns, it's kind of the same thing. But so I like having raw umber, burnt umber, raw sienna, burnt sienna, um, sepia, and one of my favorite um, shadow colors. I like Payne's gray um, to darken things rather than black, but I will use black. Um, I will tell you in every painting video that I have, I will occasionally use black. I don't see any problem with using black. Um, it's a, it's a color in the world. I, I don't understand why, you know, watercolorists, they'll, they'll, the purists will go, oh, but mix black. And it's like, yeah, but that's a pain in the butt. Um, if you want to put black into your painting, put black into your painting. But here we go. At the moment, we're keeping it pretty monochromatic. The egg's a little bit cooler. The, the, the protoceratops is a little warmer. Now I'm going to put, start putting a little, a little background underneath them too. I'm just going to do a little bit of dotting with water. Now you notice most of what I do is, um, painting, uh, wet on dry, or if I'm painting wet on to, wet into wet, it'll be in the area that I've already painted. And that keeps um, my area contained. It's not like I've got water flowing all over the place. So it's like you can tell there, it's like these little puddles of wet here and there. And I'll even use them to spread things out. It's, so it's like I'm when my brush goes out of camera, I'm going back to my palette to pick up more paint. And then I'm going back to the paper. But you'll notice I'm doing primarily right now wet on dry. And what I'm doing is I'll, I'll do all different areas of the painting while I'm working on it. Because what I'm doing is I'm allowing this area here to get a little drier. And like his head has already gotten a little bit more dry. You can see what, what you'll get used to after you've been painting in watercolor for a while is you'll see how um, the painting will get drier, but it'll still be damp. So that'll allow the, the paint to flow a little bit into different areas. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a little bit of blue. I've dipped into some ultramarine and I'm going to just, you'll notice it doesn't look like ultramarine. It looks kind of like black, but that's because it's into the yellow. And then I'm going to dip a little bit into, I have permanent mauve over here. I like to take my shadows um, to the blue and purple. And I was saying that I, I don't, that I have, don't have any problem using black. I start by adding color before adding value. Or again, you're adding value with color. If you want to go darker real fast, add purple. Purple will take you dark. You can see how fast I'm putting this arm behind the his further the arm that's further back. I'm putting it in shadow by adding purple, and it's just it's a really light. Whenever you use purple, be very very judicious with it. Keep it really light because your purples will go dark really fast when you're painting in watercolor. But it's like, again, he's a, he's, I've started with a yellow base in his skin and purple is your complement, and a little bit of purple starting back is a really, really nice shadow on him. And it'll give you, when those two colors mix, when the yellows and the purples mix, they come up with a kind of gray that is much richer than if you had said, per se, used, um, say, a sepia or um, one of the browns. Okay, now what I'm going to do on the egg, I want to take it a little bit darker back. This is my favorite color to add for shading in odd circumstances where I don't really want to go black, but I want to go dark. This is Payne's Gray. And Payne's Gray has a blue tone to it. 
So it's not, it's very transparent. It'll give you that black, but it's got this really, really nice richness to it. And it dries with um, a nice tone to it too. And I want to keep the egg a little warmer. So what I'm going to do in the front, I'm going to use some sienna. Now that's going down a little dark for me. And it's also, you can see the, the egg's still pretty wet. So you're getting that foxing on the edges as I lay it down. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take my paper towel and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come in and I'm going to pick out the color that I just laid down. And so I've got a little bit of foxing in it. It's still dark. But then I pulled out the real heaviness of it. So I've got, I still have the richness of that sienna in there, but it's not as dark now. And because the paper has, is still damp, I'm able to get a little bit of foxing and a little bit of blending at the same time. And this is something, I, I hate to say it, it's all a matter of, of experience. You, you've got to play with it some, and you've got to not be afraid to make mistakes. And honestly, it's like, it, it, it's, it's one of those, okay, do several dozen paintings and try not to, just try not to worry about making mistakes. Um, one of the things that I'm a big one for, make a million mistakes and stuff will turn out fine. A lot of times it's like when you do something where you think it's really terrible, um, you look at it again a month later, you know, stick it in a drawer, look at it again a month later, and usually it's like, hey, that's not as bad as I thought it was when I was working on it. And that's with all artists. If you're, you're a person who really wants to try and really wants to get there, we all hate our own work when we're done with it. It's like, okay, that didn't quite turn out the way I wanted it to. And then you pull it out, you know, a month or two later and you're going, gee, that's actually looks really good. Why did I think that looked that bad? And that's, it, it, that's just the way painting's going to go. Um, if you're, you're an artist, you're never, you're never going to ever be totally satisfied with what you do. It's always a matter of, okay, try, fail. It happened, it worked, it didn't work. Okay, now you, you can tell I'm heavying up the color now. Okay, it's like you want to start, again, with watercolor. It's a transparent medium. You start out as light as you can to figure out where you want your colors, how you want your color scheme to start working out. And then you start adding more intensity. And it doesn't take much with watercolor. That's the thing. It's like learning how to keep it thin at the beginning to get the color down. And then you come in and you heavy it, heavy it up and you pop it up. Um, I'm going to throw some more a little blue and a little purple in the shadows again. And the, that's the other fun thing about watercolor is it, it takes care of itself. I mean, a lot of times it will give you things that you weren't expecting it to give. And it'll, it'll come out the way you weren't expecting it to come out. You, you kind of figure, okay, it's going to do this, this, and this. But then it always surprises you. I, I guess that's what I kind of like about it is it's, it's like it paints itself, I feel. Um, it gives me texture that um, if I had to use some other medium, I wouldn't get this kind of texture. I would really have to work it out. Whereas with watercolor, it, it does the texture on its own because it's using the paper and it's using the, um, the uh, way the pigment within the water and the paper combine together to give you those marvelous textures that you can only get with this medium. Um, I've seen some stuff on computer that comes real close. Um, I haven't played with a lot of watercolor technique on computer. Most of my most of my stuff on computer ends up being looking more like uh, airbrushing or airbrush work or oil work than uh, my watercolor. And the other thing is is that you'll notice this is a pretty dang fast painting. We're we're just about done here. I've got a few details 
but for the most part um, I'm just gonna let some of the areas dry a little bit more so I can put some uh, detailing on it and that beak area um, the thing is is that it, this is um, kind of common in the um, the uh, paleontological illustration world where they they kind of like to to uh, emphasize the beak we have no idea what these guys look like we have no idea what color they were we have you know we can guess at things from their environment but there's no real saying you know what they looked like now the the, the eggs a little plain so I'm gonna take a little bit of burnt umber I'm gonna pokey dot it a bit um, and that's saying you know it's like most most lizard eggs they're pretty plain they don't have much to them but I'm gonna give this a little bit of modeling because some birds eggs have some modeling on them don't want to quite make it look like an Easter egg so I don't want to keep the, the dots too even it's like uh, I had um, we have some friends who have chickens and oh my lord you know it's so much fun to get a green chicken egg for breakfast I don't know if you've ever got I mean, when somebody has fresh chicken eggs they are the greatest okay now I am going to use a slight oh I haven't even really talked about my brush I should do that shouldn't I this is a weird Windsor Newton series um, 7 uh, sable brush this one's a little bit old you can tell my the gold I'm sorry there we go in camera um, the gold that's on the the label is slowly fading off because I've used this one quite a bit um, get a series 7 brush uh, this is a number two um, I like to use anywhere um, uh, usually zero two um, three six don't get it six will cost you an arm and a leg um, but the thing is is that because they are sable brushes they last forever and they will do whatever you want to do with them I am brutal totally brutal on my brushes I kill my brushes I beat them up um, where is... Okay. this is the other kind of brush I like to use this is a synthetic brush this is a, a uh, a low Cornell um, tenot. <laughs> if if you want to do detailed stuff, um, I usually buy them in in like packs of five. Because again, I'm brutal. the The sad thing is about synthetic brushes is that they um, they their tips have a tendency to break down after a while. And like I said, I'm extremely brutal on my brushes. Let's see here. I'm going to get a little bit of Payne's Gray. And this time I'm not going to be light with it. I'm going to try to be a little more heavy with it. Now, if you want to detail things, you have to wait until the paper dries totally. You can tell this paper is not entirely dry yet. And still foxing a bit so I'm giving him a little bit of um, gonna make him striped I'm thinking um, have you guys ever seen um, Havelina babies it's like the mothers are, are nice and solid but the babies are striped so I'm thinking he's gonna this guy's gonna be like a Havelina baby he's gonna be striped and that's the thing too is when when people are doing um, dinosaur renderings nowadays they're thinking in terms of what similar animal in a similar niche um, what kind of markings do they have and the best dinosaur renderers out there right now are doing that kind of thing that they'll they'll uh, they'll come up with patterns and colors that would be equivalent to 
some kind of animal that would live in a similar environment or would have a similar, similar niche to that particular animal. Um, so if we're, we're looking at, at the um, protoceratops, it was living in a semi-arid environment. It was a uh, vegetarian, so it ate a vegetable diet. And then that's technically what a um, javelina was. And ah, pigs are actually, they're, they're, um, they're also omnivores. And there's no saying that a protoceratops couldn't have been an omnivore too. With a beak like that, um, it's kind of like when they, when I always crack up when, when somebody says that an animal is a vegetarian. One of the things that we do know is that vegetarians eat a lot of insects. I mean, you're never going to stop a cow from hoovering up, you know, a lot of insects with every mouthful of grass it eats. Okay, I'm basically done with the painting itself. Now, I'm going in a little early here because the, the, egg, the egg's still a little bit damp. But when I get done with any painting I do, what I do is I will go over the painting again with ballpoint pen to heavy up the outline, to clean up the line. And also, um, some of the, you can see that some of the, the ink pen has faded back. It's kind of like if you've ever done, um, if you do watercolor with pencil, with straight pencil, you'll find that the pencil, um, even though it's still there, um, it'll also, it'll get covered by the pigment that you use in watercolor, especially if you're using um, a lot of the earth tones or the cadmiums, um, cobalt and ultramarine. If you're using these colors, they have a lot of pigment in them. So if you're doing a pencil um, as you're underdrawing, the pencil will still come through, but the... Um, the paint will be heavier over it. And I would suggest if you, if you do are doing pencil, you are doing ink. If you want your final drawing to, or your final piece to come out a little bit crisper, um, I would still go over either or both pencil and pen in the end to heavy up the lines you're using. Now I haven't done his eye yet. She's the main, main focal point of the, the, the poor little kid. And I usually start with the eye. The eye is usually the center of what I do. And this time, <laughs> it's the last thing I'm doing. Okay. But since I've done it this way, hopefully it will give me an opportunity for you to show you a few things too here. Okay. Let that dry a little bit. While it's letting it dry, I'm finishing up the uh, pen here. But anyways, as I was saying, going in here, getting some detail. Now, the, because the uh, the um, the paper is still a bit damp here. It's also um, smearing the ink a little bit on my texture on the egg, which is fine. In this particular one, that's cool. I'm doing a little bit of cross hatching in the back here to pull out the, uh, the shell. Do it a little bit here too. There we go. Now, let's see here. You'll notice there's a little bit of pen on the outside here that I might want to clean up just a bit. Here's a technique that I use for if you've never, um, if you make a mistake on watercolor or watercolor paper, this is a, your standard X-Acto knife blade. What I will do is I will take it and you can literally scrape and just really careful. Think of it as it's, it's just like when you have an eraser. Um, watercolor paper has got a really high um, 
um, thread count, <laughs> this is the way I can put it, and the um, size that they use when they're making paper glues all that paper together nicely. So the thing is, is that because this is good paper, and that's why you should use good paper, um, again, this is Canson. Um, this is cold press. I forgot to say that when I when I first started the other um, video, but this is Canson um, cold press watercolor paper. And the difference between cold press and say hot press, cold press they the paper is literally just when it's wet when they they press the water out of it they don't add any heat to it and so there's a little bit of a bump to it and the watercolor paper will the watercolor will fall into the um the the dimples so you'll get a dimpled paper with cold press whereas with hot press they run it through metal drums and it's called calendared and so it gets to have a smooth surface and i use both kinds of paper for different purposes this particular um, paper is um, cold press but anyways after you have taken that take your kneaded eraser and get the rest of the paper up with the kneaded eraser and that usually does it if it doesn't i mean you can literally um the back of this is I said this is a paper mate um, mechanical pencil and the end of theirs they use a latex eraser on the end of their theirs or you can use you know your standard latex eraser and go in and clean it up just a little bit more and then go back in with your kneaded eraser and I defy you to have somebody look at that and tell, tell that you ever did anything wrong. You can, and you can do that with a lot of areas. Um, let's see here. Another thing I want to do is, it's not quite dry, but I'm going to pick it out anyways. You'll notice the eye here. I always like to have a highlight in the eye so I can take my, my knife. And after I've, I've done all my painting... I'll carefully, literally pick out the white in the eye. And I'm literally cutting away paper. And you're, you're just, you're filing it down like you'd file it down with a knife or a razor. That's what it's doing. And then you take your kneaded eraser, rub into it, go back in. And that gives me that nice highlight. Now, now with the uh, the color in his eye, it's just a little yellow. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go in with a darker yellow and put it down here. Because what happens with an eye, you put the highlight over here and you put the shadow over here. I did that wrong. I did that wrong. As I, I'm doing, it's like, because so I'm telling you how to do the eye and I'm telling you how to do it wrong. Actually, you want to get the dark around the highlight. And give him a darker eye. And the gold actually goes on the other side because it's the, the lights reflecting through to the other side. So, what I want to do actually is I want to pick the color out of there. And again, if you want to pick out color, something got too dark, just take clear water and scrub it into wherever you want to get rid of the color. And then blot it with a paper towel, and that pulls out the color. Get that around there too. Okay, so you've just, I've just blotted out the color. Now I'm going to take a little burnt sienna and I'm going to put it around the highlight to make it look a little dark. There we 
go. That nah, gives them a nice glossy eye. And I'm just, as, as the painting's drying here, I'm looking at the shadows and I'm looking going, eh. I want to shadow them up just a little bit more. Give them a little bit more volume. So then I'm doing that with a little paint's gray. And I think I'm going to throw a little bit of blue into the shadows here. Um, I really like using um, a Windsor or a um, Prussian blue for shadows too. Just because it gives um, a little bit of an accent. And it's it's a it's almost a turquoise color. Any any kind of turquoise blue makes a nice. If you're adding it into the shadows, gives some additional punch. Okay. Little... Okie doke. And that's basically it. And then you throw a signature on it. And that's it. That's your baby Protoceratops. Um, thank you for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video. And uh, I hope I was able to teach you something today. Thank you very much. And hope you stop by again. Again, I'm Lynn Hunter. Um, my... YouTube channel is Lynn Hunter, <laughs> L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R, and I also have a Patreon channel, um, patreon.com, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R. Thank you very much for stopping by.